thank you for inviting me to come over here, actually. It's been, it's been very nice, uh, enjoyable visit to Dublin. Uh, I had an in interesting plane journey over here because I, I'd brought quite a lot of equipment with me. Obviously, I didn't bring the air track with me on the plane. This, this was kindly lent uh, by, um, by, by, the, by schools in Dublin. But I had my, my suitcase consisted of lots of wires, crocodile clips, batteries, Wii controllers, uh, blue tack, and a turntable. So as I went through flight control, as I went through security, there was a, a few a few raised eyebrows, and, and they took my bag to pieces and, and were querying as to what I was doing. But I got on the plane. So that was that was okay. Um, so just just to introduce what I'm what I'm going to talk about. Um, basically, what I've always been I've always been interested in computer games, and uh, since becoming a teacher, trying to uh, it's, I, I use computer games as a way of getting kids interested in physics because there's a lot of physics in computer games and so I'm going to show you some some of those things during the course of today there's I have a website uh, which is uh, every the, uh, the PowerPoints which I'm going to use today uh, will be available for download anyway but I think it's actually already on my website but there's also lots of instructions on there about how to get yourself started do, doing this the thing I'm going to show you today is to how to use these, these things called Nintendo Wii controllers, which some of you, some, many of you may have seen, but if you, if you haven't seen them, the, the majority of the pupils that you teach will, will know what they are, which is one of, the, one of the great advantages because it's something that's familiar to them. Um, so there's some instructions on there to get you completely started uh, to, to, to use these as a, basically a cheap way of doing data logging in the classroom for doing demonstrations. Um, so, I can use this clicking thing, if it works. Uh, no, it's not going to work. I'll just use the... Right. So, my inspirations, where, my inspirations of this go back to 1982 when I, when I got my first ZX Spectrum with rubber keys. <coughs> and I played on this game quite a lot and destroyed quite a lot, quite a lot of uh, keypads and joysticks doing this. Because this is, this is a game called Daily Thompson's Decathlon, which involved... <laughs> It involved making, making the man run as fast as you could, and, and to make him run, you had to hit one key to make him run one, for make one leg move and then the other key for the other leg. And so you ended up doing this or hitting a joystick like this. So I have, I have a great deal of fun with computer games. And, and 2006, a whole revolution in computer gaming came out because it was, uh, it was the, with the introduction by Nintendo of their, of, their, of their Wii controller, of their Nintendo Wii system. Um, right. So... What got me into the idea of using computers in, in computer games in physics was early on in my teaching career. Uh, there's, a, there's a lady called Helen Pollard who works for the IOP in the UK. And she gave a, she gave a, a presentation one, one day um, a, a part, as part of some inset, uh, just ideas for use in the classroom for things that you can do to, to engage children with physics. And um, what the, the, the thing that really caught my attention to this, this was this, the idea you could use a racing game for teaching speed time graphs. Okay? You can buy very cheap racing games to install on your, on, on, on your computer. And what you get the kids to do, you get all these racing games have, have, have several features. First of all, the kids can drive the car in the classroom, so they, they get quite excited about this. Um, but what you've got on here is you've got the speed of the car that's, that it's going. And you've also got somewhere on here a time. Okay, so what you, can, what, you get, what you get the kids doing is you can get one person driving, another person who shouts every five seconds what the speed is, and you get the rest of the class recording the speed. Okay, so you go one lap around the circuit, and what you get is, if you plot it out, a speed time graph. Okay, so this was me doing it, and you can see I had a bit of a crash at this point, I think, and slowed down. Um, and this... So we, I mean, at my school, we have an old Xbox that my, that my, my, my departmental head uh, it was a broken one, so I fixed it, and now, well, now it's, the, it's the physics department Xbox, so we get a lot of jokes from other, other colleagues that we just basically spend our time playing computer games. Um, but but we, I, we use this in, in, in teaching, because there's basically several... several um, so I use Forza, which is a sort of cheap racing game, and I get the kids they are do, doing this. And you've never seen a, a, a group of... 14-year-olds plotting a speed time graph as far as, uh, because what I do, that one person takes the data, and then, so one person does the, does the driving, the rest of the class are taking data, and then I say the first person to present me with a speed time graph 
that's correctly plotted, and they've worked out roughly the area underneath it to work out the, the length of the lap, gets to drive the car next. So you can use this as a revision lesson. And, and the, the silence descends, and they're all busily plotting graphs and working out areas under, under the graph. So it's a really good, it's a really good sort of uh, teaching thing. And if you know what the, the distance is beforehand, you know what, what the answer that you're expecting is to get. So this, this was what got, got me into this. Then I was browsing the internet one day, and I came across some websites where people had been using Nintendo Wii controllers for, for non for non-Nintendo-based game. Uh, so this one here, they'd used the controller to measure the rate of evaporation of water in a tank. Basically, what the controller was doing, it was measuring the height, uh, or measuring the distance to this, this, this plastic boat. And as the water evaporated, the plastic boat descended. And they were able to measure the rate of evaporation, and they were able to do various things. Uh, it was, I, I thought it was a, a nice novel use for it. But the one that got me really interested was that someone had hooked up their, their Wii controller to a laptop, and then they'd gone to a racetrack with their car. They'd taken the laptop and the, and, and the Wii controller into their car and strapped it all in. And they were able to measure the acceleration of their car, so they could floor it and measure the acceleration and go around corners very quickly and they're able to measure the, 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 the g-forces or the forces that are acting on the car. So this, this got me kind of interested. The problem with both of these things is that there was no software at the time that could actually take the data directly and plot it out. What they were doing, they were just recording the data and then doing something with it afterwards in Excel. So I had a lot of computer, computer skills from, from my previous jobs and things, so I, I decided that I would take it upon myself to try and write some software to actually get the data and plot it in real time so we could actually use it for doing something. So first of all, let's just quickly just describe what this is about, what, what the, one of these things is. So it's, 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 the controller basically has, allows you to interact with the game. So who's, ha, ha, just a quick show of hands, who's, who's used one of these? So a lot of people have used one of these. Basically, what it, what it allows you to do is you can, you can sort of wave it around like this in a fighting game, or you can, uh, you can select things from a screen, or you can use it to, to control a character on the screen. So you, you can, you can, it's, it's quite a revolution in gaming, because up, up, up until this point, you'd been, you'd been fixed to a keyboard or you'd been fixed to a controller. Now you sort of became the controller and actually you started waving th people around. And it, when they first came out, lots of, lots of TVs got broken because they, people weren't strapping the things onto their wrists and they were getting very animated and letting go of them. And there's lots of flat screen TVs got, got, got broken and, uh, straight after Christmas. Um, so just to, just to show you is a quick video uh, of, of someone playing with this. And basically what you can do, you see, you can actually use the controller to navigate your way around. In this case, it was, it was um, flying an aeroplane. You can, you can do sort of stunts with the aeroplane. So and this, this is what, this is, these are the sort of things you can do. The reason you can do this is because, because of the electronics inside here allows it to work out things like acceleration. It allows it to work out your position, how far you are away from the screen. So this man takes it very, very seriously. He can, by the look of it, but he's also very good at it. He wouldn't want to. He's probably be not the ideal person to play against because he'd probably win all the time. Because he does look, he does look very, very serious about it all. So here he's doing some archery. Uh, it was obviously a, cle a clever piece of design by the by by the people at Nintendo to actually think this up. And it and it's you know it's. So here he is doing some doing some rowing, uh, but you, you get the general the general gist of what you can do. So how how can we get how can we teach physics using this thing? Okay, well first of all, there's actually a lot of interesting physics and technology that's actually in here. So you can start as an introduction. They can they can all all of a sudden see that something they've got at home. There's a lot of physics in that, and actually. To understand that to actually produce something like this requires a, a big, a lot, lots of knowledge of electronics, physics, and engineering. Um, so basically, what you've got is it communicates using Bluetooth. So between this thing and normally a console that you would buy, there's a Bluetooth connection that allows that allows data to stream back and forth between the two things. Um, and this is the secret to actually using it on your PC because many laptops have got Bluetooth installed on them already. And when you try to connect this via Bluetooth, it comes up on your laptop as being a mouse. 
So it, the, your laptop, to, your, to your laptop, it thinks, it thinks that this is a mouse, so you can actually start to do things with it. So once you can intercept that stream of data to your laptop, you can actually start, you can actually start seeing what the data contains, and then you can actually then take, take that data and display it on the screen. Um, so it also uses infrared. There's a, there's a very high resolution, well, relatively high resolution camera for the time on the front of here. That's actually how it, uh, you'll see in a moment, actually how you can actually um, get position data from it. Um, there's, a, there's, other one, there's one other crucial component. And on top of your TV, if you've got one of these, if you, go, if you have a Nintendo, you'll have something that looks a bit like this. It's called a sensor bar. And the sensor bar is actually very rather misnamed because it doesn't actually sense anything at all. If you take your uh, digital camera and take a picture of it, which is what I did here on top of mine, you'll see that it's actually just a collection of LEDs. So they're infrared LEDs. And, what it, and, and to the controller, what this sees, the camera in front of here, sees a group of LEDs here and a group of LEDs here. And from knowing the distance between these two sets of LEDs and <clears throat> where the thing is. It can use some ba very basic trigonometry and actually triangulate to where, it, to where it actually is in space. So as it moves backwards and forwards, it can look at how far the pixels are apart that it's detecting on here and back, and back calculate the distance between the two things. And I'll, I'll, so let's demonstrate that. So. Um, I need someone to help me with this. Uh, if I can just, if someone, someone's willing to look slightly silly by wearing this pair of 3D glasses. Um, there we go. So this was this. Um, the 3D glasses in this don't actually make a difference. They just, I just ha happen to have quite a lot of pairs of 3D glasses because my local Odeon cinema, every time they had a 3D film on, they didn't take them in to start off with. They're, they're now they've, they've, got, they've got wise to this and they, they actually sell them, uh, so you have to buy them every time. But to start off with, they were just giving them away. So I collected lots of these because there's, there's some interesting physics in these in themselves. If you take, because instantly I got, I got two of them together, was trying to work out how they worked. And it's all to do with circularly polarized light and things like that. So, so the 3D glasses aren't actually important. You just need some, fr some frame with which to support two LEDs. So you can go, I don't, do you have Maplin, Maplin's uh, in, in Ireland? Maplin, you can go and buy a pair of LEDs like this for about two pounds. Um, so they're just, just bog standard infrared LEDs, the same kind of thing as you would have in your TV remote controller. So if you would put those on for me, please. And what you need to do is to stand uh, in front of, just in front of here and look into the camera here. And just stand, stand a little bit further back. A little bit further back still. Right, so what you can see, actually the lighting on here is a little bit... Uh, there's a pair of dots here, and there's a, there's, a sort of, there's a sort of screen over here. The pair of dots is what the controller is seeing. It's seeing two LEDs, and it dis it's displaying them on the screen. And if you move your head around like this, so as he's moving his head around, it's, it's working out using triangulation where his head is and actually changing the perspective of what you see on the screen. Okay, so the, the, idea of, the idea of this in future, you could potentially have a real virtual reality sort of game uh, where you could look around corners and things like that, and you can actually, you're actually really going to be completely and utterly immersed into the game. So this, was, this, is, this is the idea of using triangulation. And if you move slightly further back, you'll see that the things start to get slightly smaller and the perspective changes. So it, it, has, it has a notion of, 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 of the three-dimensionalness of, 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 of the space that we're living in. Okay, this is not particularly, if you stay there a minute, this is not, obviously not particularly useful for physics, but just, this is just a nice little demonstration of how, how the thing works. Quick bit of maths, this is how it, how it actually works. And so what, what I did, I took this idea and incorporated it in some software. All you've got to do you need to know the distance between the two dots, so the, the distance between those two LEDs. If I measure on the screen, and, but the screen has got, let's say, a thousand pixels across, if I measure the distance between, those, between the pair of pixels that are being lit up by the glasses, if I know the angular resolution of those pixels, so if I know that a certain number of pixels corresponds to a, a certain angular separation. I can backtrack everything, and I can get 
the distance from the controller to the, the LEDs. So just a simple bit of trigonometry. And so if you plug this formula into some software, you can actually get it to, do, to, to measure how far away you are. Um, so if, this is the software that I wrote. <coughs> and this is free to download, so all you need is a, a, a laptop with XP or something on it. Um, and if we just do... Okay, so if you just move backwards and forwards, so as he moves backwards, it's, it's detecting that he's moving backwards. If you stay still, okay, that's, so it's staying still. And now if you move slightly towards the, the, the camera, and stop, okay. And so basically what it's doing, it's, 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 this is, this, if you were doing physics, you, be te you, you teach them about distance time graphs. Okay, this is a sort of elementary thing in, in, in motion and kinematics. And so what you're going to do here is that rather than doing it in a very abstract way, you get one of the children to don the glasses and look silly. Okay, and then what I tend to do is I, I won't, write, won't write on the screen here because, of, because I'll get in trouble. Uh, but if I'm on my whiteboard at school, I'll, just, I'll draw a distance time graph on the board and say to them, right, let's talk through the distance time graph. Right, now you, need to, now you need to act out that distance time graph by walking backwards and forwards and so that they, they can actually see how to do this. So this would cost you the price of a Wii controller, which is about 20 pounds, or if you, might, you may have one already at home, a pair, a pair of glasses or something to fix, to fix those LEDs onto, and a pair of LEDs. So for 30 pounds, you can equip your department with, with something like this. We have something that does this similarly, which one of these, one of these motion sensors that sends out ultrasonic pulses that costs several hundred pounds, I think. So uh, this is a much cheaper way of doing it. Okay, you can, you can take off the glasses now. Pardon? Um, they, in fact, all it needs to do is it needs to give out infrared. So they need to be infrared LEDs. You don't actually need to have LEDs at all. You can use bulbs because incandescent bulbs will give off lots of LED, in fact, so lots of infrared light. In fact, you can substitute your, your, your thing on top of your TV if it breaks or, you, or, or something with a pair of candles and it will actually work. As long as you put two candles separated by the same distance, because the candles are giving off, in, they're incandescent, so they're giving off lots of infrared, the, 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 the Wii controller will actually pick that up and just, just see it as being the two spots of light. So it, uh, you can do it with candles if you really want to, but I wouldn't recommend putting candles on a pair of glasses. Um, so this, this was the software I developed, and so this, so this, this, is, this is free. Some people might have, and I, this is what I'm going to use for... for, for um, for the, so several of my things because it's, because it's, it's all set up and, and quicker to do. But we have a piece of software called Data Logging Insight. I, I'm friends with the author of this software, so I actually showed him what I'd done, and he's incorporated my stuff into his, this. This is commercial software. I didn't get any money out of it, but this is, this is a very good piece of software because it, if you have any data loggers at school, it, it basically will work, the, so, the same software will work with all different types of data loggers. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very good bit of software to, to use. Right, it's also got an accelerometer. So we can get distance information, but we can also get, we can also get some information about acceleration. So if I look, if I pick up my controller over here, what's being displayed here is that what's happening to the controller and what, the, what this, in the center of mass frame, what's actually happening inside. So you imagine the accelerometer is basically being a ball with some springs on it. As I shake it about, the springs are, are moving around, and what it's detecting is the, sort of the, 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 the movement or the inertia of, of, the, of the ball. And as, as the controller moves, it picks up the acceleration. And so you can actually get this acceleration out, out of the controller, and therefore you can start to measure acceleration in the lab. So this is, and this is, this is very useful in doing all sorts of physics experiments. Okay, so the typical experiment, I mean, at, at sort of higher level, you, you start learning about simple harmonic motion. Um, and so the idea of simple harmonic motion, the classic system I have, in fact, on my projector at school, I have some springs already attached on there that I can just use to demonstrate SHM. Why did I put that on? So you can actually now substitute that, and you can put your Nintendo controller onto the, onto the springs. This, this sensor bar here um, is one that you can buy that's, that's wireless. 
I mean, the only way it's wireless, it, it means it doesn't, it doesn't connect to the, 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 not the, it doesn't get its power from the, 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 the Wii console. Instead, it's got some batteries in it, so it's not particularly uh, high tech. But you can make your own of this as well. You can either put a pair of candles on the floor, a pair of bulbs on the floor, or a pair of LEDs on the floor. As long as you know the distance between them, that's, it's all fine. So you put that on the floor. So now, the key thing is you can start to do experiments using your Wii controller to actually demonstrate real physics. So if I bring up the software. So this is the, this is the commercial software. It's just, it's just, I can just click a button and it will actually go straight to what I need to do. So if I get this oscillating, we can see we get two traces. Okay, blue trace is the acceleration and the brown trace is the distance from the controller to the floor. So you instantly can demonstrate the, 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 the principle of simple harmonic motion in that the acceleration is always out of phase with the displacement from equilibrium. So the idea that the two, the two, things, the two things are connected, but you're recording both of them at the same time. So, and if you want to, you can go ahead and work out from there. You can differentiate the distance get the velocity time graph, or you could actually integrate the acceleration and get the velocity time graph that way. So you can, you can, you can backtrack and relate all these, all these things together. So that's SHM with a, a Wiimote on a spring. And this is some of the data you can get. So, you know, this, this, this as I say, this illustrates the, the nicely the, 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 the thing that students have to learn about SHM, the things they have to be able to recite in the exam, is that the acceleration for SHM is always directly proportional to the displacement from the equilibrium position. And they can see that straight away um, from the data. So the next thing, so I got quite excited by this, and then I thought, well, what else can you do? Well, I, I'd actually found that there was someone else who was doing something similar. They had shown in the European Journal of Physics that you could do this, but they had, didn't have any software. They were recording it and then plotting it out later. So the, the, my, the thing, my, my software allows you to actually in, to display things in real time, which is, the, which is the sort of big breakthrough for this. Well, I thought, well, if you can do masses on springs, then the other, the other, the other type of SHM that you might need to do is a, is a, is a pendulum. And so for a pendulum, I just basically, if you connect your controller to a, bit, to a piece of string. And what I've done, I have, this piece, I have the piece of string like that so it constrains the motion to only happen in one dimension. It's, otherwise, it starts to wobble around. And if I... Uh, oh, I'll need to go back around this side. If I do that, I can watch this going. If I start it swinging... doing that. Let's just do it on the other one. Sorry about this. Technical problem. Um, you can instantly see that if I get it swinging with relatively large amplitude motion, you can that, you're measuring the acceleration along that direction. So you can, you can measure the acceleration of a pendulum and, and show that it's, it's sinusoidal and going to give you an S, uh, a similar thing to SHM. Pardon? At the moment, I'm not using that because all it's doing is taking the accelerometer measurements and just, just plotting that out directly. You can, the, so I have placed the bar on the ground. If you want to do more sensitive measurements, what you can do, so imagine... The camera is a screen. It's got a pic it's 768 by 1024 pixels. If I plot where one light source is on there, as I swing it just very gently, I could actually plot. It, 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 will, it will display how the thing is moving in the air. So that's what I've got, got set up just here. And um, so if you do that, so it's, it's a very small amplitude motion you can now you see it's just it's just moving very very slightly you get this beautiful 
sine wave trace coming out again. So it's showing you that the pendulum swing is again, is, 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 is gives you this nice sinusoidal trace, roughly sinusoidal. Okay, so that was SHM. I thought, what can I do next? What other experiments can I do with this? So where else is in physics is acceleration going to be important? Well, circular motion acceleration is going to be important. So I found our, our turntable. I motorized it by improvising with some elastic bands and things because we didn't have a motorized turntable. Um, so what I've got here is, so if you blue tack on and you want to do this quite firmly, a Wii controller onto a turntable, you can then start to measure the centripetal acceleration as it starts to spin round. So if I do that, action mode, circuit. My software has got lots of um, pre-set up modes, so it's all easy to, to use. And so if I start things spinning round, In fact, if I just plot out, there's obviously three axes that it can accelerate. One axis will always display an, an acceleration. This acceleration is measured in G. So one axis will always display 1G because it's sitting in the Earth's gravitational field. So one accelerometer, is, one axis is always being pulled down. Um, one should sit at zero. That's the one, that's, that's going to be the tangential component of the acceleration. So there should be no, if I've set it up correctly, there should be no acceleration along that direction. And there should, but there should be a centripetal acceleration. And as I vary the speed, the blue line starts to increase. You have to be a bit careful that it doesn't spin off. And we can see that we can now measuring the centripetal acceleration. So, and as I control it, that component, this one here, is uh, because it's not perfectly aligned on the turntable. It's getting there's there's a bit of a mixture on, on here. But we can see you can you can now see you can start to measure the centripetal acceleration. Traditionally, to do this, you'd have a big turntable with a dynamics trolley connected with some springs and try me and try measuring it that way. It's a very fiddly experiment to try and do uh, with kids. But this you can get set up very quickly and start making some quantitative measurements. What I wanted to do though was to actually make this quantitative. I, I do all these things as demonstrations. I get the kids involved uh, with, with classes, but we have relatively small classes at A-level. Um, and then I get them to analyze the data. So the, the thing I wanted to try and do was to actually um, make this a little bit more quantitative. I wanted to measure how fast the turntable was spinning. So I had a bright idea that I could measure how fast it was spinning if Every time the controller went around, if I measured the fact that as the controller comes around, it will see a light beam coming from here. And so that will clock the fact that it's gone round. And I'll, show, I'll demonstrate it, it will become more apparent. And so what we're measuring here, and it's not working terribly well. Those clocks here, these pulses, are every time the controller meets the front of that, it says, it says right, I've, see, I've seen you. So that's one complete rotation. So now we've got time along here. We can now measure the time for a rotation. And I can then vary, I can vary the speed so I can make it go faster. And the ticks should get closer together. So I sent, I, I, we, we, we download all this, I put it onto our, onto our website, the kids download it at home, and then they have to, their homework was to, this maybe get, it's going a bit too fast at the moment, and their homework was to analyze it, to work, to count how many ticks, to work out the, the angular, so the, the, the rotational period, and then to work out the acceleration, and then we plotted a graph of our data. Switch that off. Uh, we plotted a graph of the data. When, look, look, well, that was the data you get. So this is measuring acceleration, change, changed it by adjusting the speed, acceleration, and the, and the different number of clock ticks. And they were very, very surprised that we actually got a straight line for a change in an experiment. Because normally we get the experiments so they don't get straight lines. And they were really quite impressed that we actually got a really good straight line. If you plot acceleration versus the frequency squared, 
um, you can you should you, that's the so it's proving that it was that, that, that you can you can do all sorts of things with this. Um, right. So then I thought, well, what else can I do? I can now attach it to my air track. This isn't my air track, as I said, but um, you can you can just attach it to an air track here, and we can start doing some collisions on air tracks, and you can start doing some some real dynamics experiments. So what I'm going to do now is to put my sensor bar over here. So what I'm going to measure is the distance between here and here, but I can also measure the acceleration of the trolley as it's going along here. So it's all a bit noisy. So if I get this going, I programmed it so if you press one of the buttons on here, it starts it logging as well, so you don't have to be next to the computer. So I press the button, it starts it logging. Actually, but one D motion. And as I move it along, you get the red being displacement time. And you, but for an added bonus, you get the blue giving you the acceleration happening each time. And so you can see every time you get an abrupt change of velocity, you get an acceleration pointing in the right direction. So you can start talking about the connection between the different types, the different sort of variables of motion that you might be talking about. And you can also think about Newton's, Newton's third law and Newton's second law. You can actually analyze, if you record the data, you can actually, um, you can actually, I just, I tried to do this. If you integrate the area under that peak, you can actually work out the change of velocity from the integral uh, because it's just an acceleration. And, it, and I just checked it by measuring the change of gradient. And to, to, to within the experimental error, they came out as, as, the, as the same number. So it was quite a nice little demonstration. I got a bit carried away with this and decided that to, to add to another feature to my program to actually make two of these things going along at once. So I had two Wii controllers bouncing into one another so we could get very complicated. Um, So this, was what we, this is what you see. I'm not going to try to set this up now. It was, it was quite a fiddly one to set up. But basically, start off with, neither of them moving. I gave one controller a tap, started it moving. So we see that it it's starts to go at a constant velocity. It bangs into the other controller. I'd, ma I'd matched them so that masses were the same. And so basically, it transfers its momentum to this one. And we can see that, we can see that the, the directions of the accelerations for both controllers are equal and opposite. So we can talk about Newton's third law, that one causes one to accelerate, and the other one gets a, an, an equal and opposite acceleration. Or you can talk, if you multiply it by mass, you can get the force. And then it, as it hit the buffers, it comes back, makes another collision, and sets it off. And, we, and, and you can get this whole, this whole thing happening. And you can so you measure the areas under the peaks, and you can just sort of do real quantitative analysis of, of Newton's first and second laws. Um, as an experiment we do in class, I get them to design a crumple zone. So we have to think of one of the th things we have to do on the syllabus is car safety. So crumple zone, the idea that you want to make the car stop over as long a period as possible in order to, to make the, change, the rate of change of momentum as small as possible. So therefore you have a, a smaller force. So what they get, they each get a trolley and they each get a load of materials to, to stick to that trolley or to build themselves a, a crumple zone. And at the end of the lesson, we have 25 minutes or so of a competition to see who's going to get the best crumple zone. And what we do, um, I get a track set up, and each, each, each pair come, come along, and what I took, put the one week, because you can't get more than one week control of it working in a classroom. It's not something you can have a whole class doing at once. I wouldn't recommend trying to do it, because it will just cause absolute chaos. Uh, but if you get them all around the front, strap this thing to, to, the, to, the, to the car, collide it into a wall, and basically, the, per, the, the, the team who get the longest acceleration time graph are the winners. And so, and the, and so they, and they've actually done some real measurements on, on car safety. Um, there's all, if, you, if, you, if you've got one of these, you might have, a, you might have a, a balance board as well. So a balance board is an, an additional component you can buy. You can actually, uh, so what, what it's got in here, it's got four, four sensors. 
in each corner. And for those four force sensors, it can work out your center of gravity. So as you move around on it, it changes the, 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 the components of your, of your weight onto each, onto each um, force sensor. And so it can do things like that. So what I, I decided, well, what, what could I do with this? Because I can also connect this up to my computer. And um, if you stand on it, and jump off it, which was this, this was what this is what this picture is showing you here. As I start to bend my legs, the force starts to reduce, okay, because uh, because I'm accelerating downwards. And then as I jump off, I get a force. And as, this is me then just leaving the board and going off here. So that was just a quick. The one thing I thought you could do with this is to take a football, bounce it on here, okay, and you could actually measure the impact force each time the ball hits. But it's actually quite hard to get the ball to bounce perfectly up and down like this. The other experiment I did that someone suggested to me, and we have, to, have tried subsequently, we have a lift in our school. And so I get my students to, to go in the lift. We have this sitting in the lift. One of them stands on the balance board while everyone else is at the bottom of the lift. Okay, and we measure as the lift starts to move we get a change in their weight. So we talk, because you, you get, you'll get, a, a, because, because of the lift starts to accelerate. And we can measure the acceleration of the lift from, from measuring this. And as it stopped again, their, their weight started to, to decrease. Um, so, so, so we could measure, and we could measure all this. And this, so they quite enjoyed doing that. For some reason, a whole group of 17 year old boys uh, we're, really in, we're really excited about the prospect of just standing in a lift going up and down. I'm not quite sure, but it's just, it was just one of those things. Um, so this, these are the ideas of things you can do. So basically, you can, if you, if you're, you, you know, it's a very cheap way of trying to do some data logging experiments. You can, and you can illustrate lots and lots of interesting physics experiments okay, using this. The idea of, it, of using it, you know, I've, so I've, I've demonstrated here, mass spring, pendulum, circular motion, air tracks. You can also do Hooke's law with it. I, I thought about adding masses to it. And you could actually work. It, you could actually get it to calculate the, how far it was and how much it had changed automatically. But that was a, that was a bit silly. You could also just take it up to a balcony and throw it off, and just look at the forces uh, and uh, sort of impact forces. One thing I did think about trying was strapping it to a rocket, and then putting this, put it, launching the rocket from the balance board. So as it launched up, you could see the acceleration forces on here, but it would also see the force on the balance board pushing downwards and things like that. I haven't tried that yet. That's, that's probably a bit, a bit, uh, a bit silly. And my health and safety might not actually be very good for that one. Um, so, some advantages to it. Basically, it's it's really cheap. You can get essentially a demonstration data logger to demonstrate lots of nice physics for you know about twenty pounds for the thing. A Bluetooth dongle you can buy for five pounds off Amazon. They, they cost next to nothing. Most laptops have got them built in. Um, and the great thing about it in terms of data logging apparatus, most of the data logging apparatus are, we have at my school is these, these archaic boxes of things that are very mysterious black box devices that the kids don't really understand how to use. Uh, this is something they've all seen. This is something that's, that they've all probably got at home and they can see the relevance that physics, you know, physics is useful. They, they, they can do something with this at home. I had quite a few of my class have gone home and downloaded the software and, and are doing stuff at home with it. And there's also other software you can use to, to, to make this into a mouse. And so you can control your computer with your Wii controller. Um, there are some limitations to it. I mean, the date, the, one of the limitations actually, which I've still not got my head around completely, is that, that the transfer rate is not constant. It transfers up to about 200 times a second, but sometimes it does it 100 times a second, and I haven't quite figured out how to, how to sort that out. It's relatively low precision, it's the, it's, and it will only do plus or minus 4G. So you can't actually take it, you can't really get, do extreme cr collisions with it. Uh, and you can't save it directly to the controller, but with my software, which is free, as I say, you can actually get it straight to that. And, and then my software will, will output the file as, just so you can just upload it in Excel and then do some stuff with it afterwards. So it's just, just a stream of numbers. Some other uses, you can, you, you can actually use it, as I say, for if, you, if you're giving a PowerPoint presentation, you can actually connect it to your computer. And the kids just like that, like that the, the, you know, the, the fact that you're controlling your computer with, with this and you can get them to do things from, 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 the, from the back of the room. You can, actually turn your, you can actually turn your normal projector and normal whiteboard into an interactive whiteboard with some software. You can actually, for about £100, you can actually create yourself your own interactive whiteboard. 
Um, and you can also use it for playing computer games, which is, the, uh, which is, which is also quite handy. And so that's it. Okay. Hopefully I've given you some, some ideas. <laughs> if there's any questions, we'll have a couple of minutes. Well, they, you can buy the, you get a rubber casing for them. And I, I've chucked it around with that, and it hasn't destroyed it. So uh, they're pretty durable. Um, so dropping it from the first story. I'd, I'd probably want to put it. I'd probably want to pad it with some. Fo I'd probably put it in a container with some polystyrene and still some foam in there. Uh, but yeah, just because otherwise you could just fall into bits, and you'd look a bit embarrassing. Yesterday you showed something with two the remotes. Yeah. possible? Yeah. I can have four um, up connected, and the, the the limitation actually is my software at that point because this is this is I'm not, I'm not a software developer, but basically it's trying to display too many different things at once, and actually the the updating and refreshing of the screen I need to be I just need to improve the the, the, the how that how that works, but it it does work and it saves the data, but it doesn't it doesn't look very pleasant because one starts to seem to seems to start to lag behind, but as soon as you stop, all the data catches up. Yeah, so it can, it, can, can, it can potentially transfer from four controllers at once at 200 hertz. Okay. So your time resolution is what, 1 over 200, which is 0 0.05, 0 0.005 seconds. Um, so 0 0.05 seconds. Um, so it's got reasonably good, reasonably good resolution, yeah. You can, uh, I mean, in terms of a collision, you can get enough resolution to actually see the car slowing down and be able to get s nine or ten points across the peak, which allows you just to, to quick make, make a quick estimate. Um, so, yeah. And my, my next little project for the Xbox, there's a Kinect. I, so my wife bought me one of these for Christmas. So I've now got the software development kit. Where, when I've got some time in my hands, I'm actually going to, to do that. So you can do the same things with a, with a Kinect. So you don't even need to hold a controller then. And you can do distance time graphs and all sorts of things. So I haven't had time to actually look into that yet, but I've just been playing games on it up till now. So, um, does your software only really work on Windows? It does, yes. But there, there, there is apparently some Macintosh. Someone else has written a Mac, some Mac software for it. Uh, I don't know anything about Macs. Okay. Um, it's only Windows XP. It will work on Windows XP. It will work on Windows 7. Okay. It won't work on earlier than XP. You need to download something. And it, when you, if you download it from my website, it's got, you can, if you choose the installer, it will check to see whether you've got everything correctly, and it will tell you what, what else you need to download. Something called, um, I forget what it's called, but it will, it will tell you that what, it, what you actually need. It will say, if this is missing, go and download it from the Microsoft website. No Mac version? No Mac version. No, I don't know anything about Macs. But potentially, potentially I could port it to Mac, because it's written in, it's written in, in Microsoft C Sharp, so I, could prob I probably could port it to Mac. But I, I, I don't have any Mac things, so I, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. Um, but my code is available, so if, 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 someone wanted to, if someone wanted to try and do that, they were, they'd be more than welcome. Yeah? Can we just, uh, I use the new one trying to get them into the, the accelerometer on it is actually being ran on twice. Pardon? The accelerometer on the Wii mode is being ran on twice. Is it? Yeah, well, okay. they're, 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 they make a version of it. Okay. Yeah, because it's just, it's just, a, it's just a, as I understand it, it's literally a chip with, with polycrystalline material in it that literally can, can it's like having masses on a, mass on a spring, and it can detect the, diff, the change in capacitance across the chip, and that's how it actually measures, that's how it then changes, that's how it measures the acceleration. Yeah, that's yeah. so quite clever. Um, and th there's another comp computing innovation recently called the Raspberry Pi. I don't know if anyone's heard of this. I've got one of those, and they're now being built in Wales. Um, so I've, I've got a team of six formers. We're building it. We're trying to build a remote-controlled Raspberry Pi uh, car that you can that has a web interface that you can log into it from one place and send it around diff a different part of the school if on the wireless network. So that's that's my sixth formers project for the year. So we we had our team meeting last week. And so they've all, they've all got their jobs to do. So we're, we're but that, but that's our, our our aim for the end of year. So I have, I have a, a club at, on a Friday lunchtime. Cause they're, they're called the Geek Club, uh, um, and they come along and do computer programming and, and various things. So it's 
Um, yes? Can I just ask something? I think it's brilliant. I love the whole idea, and there's lots that I think is really interesting about it. But I wonder, could you comment on the, the difference in the learning that you find from doing some of those experiments the old way, where they would each be making their own measurements, and a situation like this where um, the measurements are being made and the data is coming up, mm -hmm. really clever. But I, I, just I don't use it as a subject, I use it in conjunction with that. So I will, if I'm starting a topic off, I will demonstrate some facts, some things about SHM using this, and then I'll go and get them to do their own experiments on, on this. I'll go and, we have a set of data loggers that they will then use to actually record proper data and things like that. I, I really use it as a demonstration tool. That's. It's certain, I, and, and the, only, the only time we, we use it in class is, I say, is, is when we do, is I get them to use it, is when we do the, cr the crash testing. Um, but really, it's a, it's, it's a good demonstration tool, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't then say, we've done the experiment now, here's the data. Uh, I mean, the circular motion one, I, I wouldn't do the experiment anymore, because I just think that, that experiment with, the, with, the, with the, the, the cart connected by springs, trying to touch a contact, it never worked very well. So it, it, so I, I do, I, that's the one time I, I would give them that data and say, there's, there's your data to analyze. But in general, I use it, I use it as an add-on. Um, okay, if you, if you want to ask me anything else, in terms of, thank you.